I am Duke Sharn, Chair of the Legion World of Maryland Emergency Preparedness Committee. What I would like to do before we have our guest speakers come on is tell you a little bit about your Emergency Preparedness Committee. As you know, Legion World has several committees, and they're made up by residents that live here, which is a great advantage to all of the committees because we are involved in working with Leisure World to improve le Leisure World living every day. So what we have done, we have developed several areas that I call pathways to provide you with emergency information. We have modeled our area of, of factor of giving things based upon what the Federal Emergency Management Agency has done. They have said that they have made a pyramid where they list the various levels of responsibility for the country. It starts off with the citizens. So we, being citizens, we are the same thing here, we are the residents. So we have modeled our program the same way, but we only have three tiers. And this is how we try to approach emergency preparedness from our standpoint to getting information to you. As residents, you are the base of what goes on in this community as far as we're concerned. Our charter specifically says provide emergency preparedness information to the community so that they will be prepared to react to instances such as nature and man-made that may impact on their health and safety, cause them to shelter in place, or even evacuate their area. And there's only one way that that can take and be actually a way of doing something is by having the residents prepared. We go to the second level, and we figure that because we have 29 mutuals, they share in this emergency preparedness planning. But they plan differently because they do their protocols and procedures and what to do in the event that they're notified that they have to do something within their own mutual to help with the residents. The third level is your Legion World of Maryland uh, it's, a, it's the uh, LWCC board of directors with the chairman there and then with the general manager. They are the ones that work with the resources available here inside Leisure World and on the outside with the various organizations that are involved in all matters related to emergency preparedness. So what we have tried to do is bring to you by several methods, information that will help you develop your program. One of the things that's available right now on the Leisure World Net website is a statement that says, Leisure World of Maryland Emergency Preparedness Plan. That used to be part of a handout years ago when you came in as a new resident part of Leisure World Living and gave you a lot of information about amenities and other things that are here. We took that and converted it into the article that we have up on the website. We review it every year to update any information, but it gives you a very good understanding of developing a home emergency plan. It's all in the categories you will understand. It gives you areas that you might not want to use, but also that you do. In addition, we put articles in the Leisure World News on such areas as winter and summer storms, hurricanes, excessive heat, anything to help you get ready for an event that's going to happen. We also have two programs. This is one of them, the fire safety program in October. It is not the annual program, because we don't use that word. Each year we try to improve on what we did last year, so it's something new. The same way that in the month of April, we have a workshop. We invite members from the Red Cross to come to us, and we even have a couple members of the Health Advisory Committee help us develop information because we talk about, again, building 
a home emergency plan and health issues. So we're trying to cover all angles that we can get to you. But the one person that is the most important person to us is you. You are a member of a mutual. You are friendly in the neighborhood and you know people that need things. You come to these particular programs. We hope you take back to them in your mutual and your board of directors your thoughts about this and ask them all the questions you want about how well is your mutual prepared for an emergency and then how we can help you help your mutual develop a program for you. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce the committee to you. As I said, I'm Duke Ducharme. I'm a member of, as a resident of the Montgomery Mutual. I am their representative. And I'll turn it over to my vice chair. My name is Don Pruitt. I'm the vice chair of the Merger Affairs Advisory Committee, and I'm also in Mutual 14. And with that, I'll let the next member of our committee come forward. Dave Dar. I helped the group with writing, uh, especially articles from the major world news. Use the microphone. I'm Emily Gellin from Mutual 21, which is Turnberry Courts. I uh, am, in, in, with an EPAC, I'm um, chair of the program subcommittee, trying to help out with arranging programs. Good morning, I'm Jean Sinkford, and I represent a Mutual 18, and I've been on the committee for about three years now. And I'm Jackie Rabinow, formerly chair of this committee and formerly on the fire safety forum committee for the county. Uh, right now, I'm just a member of the committee. I'm Lewis Paley. Uh, I don't need a mic. Um, I'm from Mutual 23, right next door, Vantage Point West. And one thing I'd like to add on to what Duke said is if in speaking with your own mutuals, you find a need for additional information, I know one of our speakers, Jim right there, um, his full-time job is going around the county and putting on presentations in, in our case, in individual mutuals. So if you'd like to get additional information for your members who did not attend today, that's another thing you can do. Well, that's our community as it stands as a committee. You can see the number and take that and add it to the 8,000 people we have here. And you can see the few members have a very big task. So as I said before, we need your support. We need your help to help you help your mutual get prepared. Thank you. Okay, folks, what I'd like to do now is introduce uh, people on the chair. Uh, Chief, would you come up here, please? Thank you. Okay, first off, I'll start from my right the Montgomery County Fire and Rescue Chief Scott Goldstein. To his right will be Dr. James Munger. He is with the Fire Safety. It's the Fire Safety Academy. Uh, actually, I'm with Plumas. I do teach the National Fire. Academy. Okay, good. And the next gentleman to his right will be Jim Resnick, who I don't think needs any introduction. He is well versed in the community. And to his right will be Brian Geraci, who is the uh, he is the fire marshal for the state of Maryland and is also the one that will be doing the outside demonstration later in the program. And to his right 
is our former battalion chief here locally in Station 25, and now she's the assistant chief of communications for Montgomery County Fire and Rescue. With that in mind, I'll turn it over to Scott Goldstein. Oh, I'm sorry. D, excuse me. D, 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 how Richards, forgive me very much. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, and with that in mind, I'll turn it off to Scott Goldstein. Thank you. What a boo-boo. <laughs> boo-boo. So, it would really be nice if we could alter the lights a tad, just so we could see a little bit of the crowd. Alright. So, Duke, Don, thank you very much for the introductions. That was even better. <laughs> see you, now. it's our time to take a nap. Uh, thank you, thank you. It, um, appreciate the fact that the Emergency Preparedness Committee, the folks here with Inside Leadership Bowl, are taking and continue to take the role in preparedness. There is the, the, the theme of the, this year's uh, fire prevention is, is starts off with early, you know, it, it deals with early warning, early notification, and early suppression, and that's follows through with what we're talking about here today. But what you're doing today on an everyday basis and what this committee is doing for you as members of the different mutuals of the leisure world is early action. All of that notification, warning, and response or suppression is what you do have an incident to deal with. What this committee is doing and what you all hopefully take away from the day is early action. Getting that plan together, as Duke talked about it, it is part of having a plan. It is the ability to be ready for that situation and circumstances. As you all were mingling in the back earlier um, with the folks from Community Outreach, as the folks from Station 25 um, will be outside when we do the demonstration, having us, Jimmy and his, his crew, come out and do a, a home safety inspection uh, in your unit, having a focus on the, the issues at hand it is all part of having a plan. And that is gonna be critical because anything that we do through school edge education, training, practicing that what you train and learn, and having it being prepared is all what's critical for, for the points in time and need. We are very fortunate to be back here again um, to, to talk about the, the different elements and different things that influence the, the life safety focusing here as you all within this community can, can focus on. Clearly, um, history has shown us, the statistics are, are there, the, the impact of, of fire, the impact of fire injury to, to the elderly population is almost three times more uh, impactful or three times a greater risk of dying in a fire than it is to, to younger, younger members of our community. Something that clearly is a factor that we all consider when we cons are doing planning, when we are looking at those risks and when we're putting that plan together. Is it mobility issues, impairments? Is it the, the audibility, hearing as well as vision? All of those things make a direct impact to getting early notification and, and getting out. What is, this is the interactive part, this is not school, I'm not going to look for hands to be raised, I'm looking for a shout out. What is the most common cause of a home fire situation? You said it, cooking. Cooking is the most common situation that we deal with. Okay. Articulating how to do that, it could be the, the, your grandchild who's uh, cooking french fries in a pot of boiling oil and walks away from it, and that pot of boiling oil goes unattended. It could be the, the Thanksgiving turkey gone awry. It, it could be any assortment of activities in the, in the kitchen, but a cooking fire is the number one cause of home fires, and it's something that is very much, I will describe it as an avoidable and preventable type of circumstance. Regular maintenance, having making sure that that oven is clean, making sure that the the working order of your appliances, but making sure it's attended, 
attended, attended, not being distracted, not going and doing something else when you have that pot of, of, of water or something, an open flame uh, engaged. It's cooking fires is something where we really deal with an impact of, of folks getting burned as well as the, the cause of fire. As Duke talked about, you have the April form and then you have the, the one here in October. When we're here every year, we're talking about the fall. Fall is upon us. The fact that our cold suck time is, is, around, is here. Um, forecasted to be, I think, in the mid-40s tonight. Clearly, we're going to be kicking into our furnaces and our heat. We're going to be kicking into potentially some of those dangerous alternative heat sources. Um, those have and are very appropriate, but they need to be used using that same term, appropriately. Space heaters, fireplaces, wood stoves, anything along that line is, is very much a normal course of, of life to, to some within this community, as well as folks within our, our greater community. All of that is appropriate, just needs to be used um, adequately. Space heaters need Space, thank you, exactly, all right. The space heater that's sitting right next to this curtain over here, all that curtain is is flammable material. And in this auditorium, it should be flammable, blah, 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 blah. Brian, <laughs> Brian's looking at me from that perspective. But in, in your house, that curtain, that fabric material, all that is is a, a, a ignitable and a burnable component that that space heater is going to overheat, cause to get to ignition, and potentially initiate a fire situation. Space heaters need space, three foot as the general term. Uh, room around the space heater before uh, it, it, it's uh, safe to, to have furniture, a chair, or, or anything of the such nearby. And when we deal with that, literally thousands of fires a year come from these alternative heat sources. Um, and that's just because people become careless. We talked about that in the kitchen, unattentive to the activities. When those space heaters, alternative heat sources are, are used um, uh, without the due regard and the consideration of their importance, that's where we start to get into to dangerous areas. One of the things we're going to see today, actually it's two things, plumas and, and residential sprinklers, relate to technology. Uh, Jimmy, you're going to talk about what you look up, what you look at and see in the centuries. Okay, I'm not going to your studio, your studio story there. But the fact of the matter is, is technology in our industry is changing every day. No different than a lot of, of, uh, a lot of other components, industries, and, and governmental activities. But as you will see with Plumas, really advanced technology talking about fire suppression. Fire detection technology is changing and getting more and more reliable and more and more uh, capable of early warning, early detection. And as of that, what we have in this community, Montgomery County, and I, I give this very much kudos to Brian in his former career, is we have had residential sprinklers very much cemented within the community of Montgomery County by re legislative law for all structures since 2004, for all structures, right? 90X for, 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 for a townhouse, multifamily residential. It has been decades since it was a requirement that you would have a residential sprinkle system in your single family townhouse. And, and over a decade now, since you would have it in your single family detached house, those systems, as you will see out here, are lifesavers. So much that the, the ability to have a sprinkler system installed in the house, if you have loved ones who are in the preparational stages outside of Montgomery County, considering building a new house, after you see this demonstration today, you will be sold that they save lives, give you the time to get out, and, and that is a key point, and that's the most important thing to talk about as we do this early action, early notification, detection, and suppression. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Dee, because after all the earlies take care of, 
and you call 911, you're going to be talking to D. Well, that's good. good morning, everybody. Good morning. So I want to tell you a couple of things. Um, just a, a brief history about myself and why I am personally so committed to the Leisure World community. So I have almost 30 years in the fire service. I came in as a rookie, as a recruit, and I've grown up in Montgomery County Fire Service. My first couple of years in the fire service, as I was learning, as I was mentored, I'm still mentored, but when I was learning just my baseline, I did several years over here at Company 25, which is right outside your Connecticut Avenue gate. And then fast forward, uh, I guess it's been more than 12 years ago now, my parents decided we're moving to Leisure World. So Leisure World is, 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 is personal to me. Uh, and one of the reasons that I'm here today, because this community, your safety, your well-being, is very personal to me. So my parents live uh, at 3100 North Leisure World Boulevard. They are snowbirds, which maybe some of you all are. So they're here part of the time, and they're you know in Florida part of the time, um, but they're, they're residents of this community. Uh, also, fast forward in my career, when I was promoted to the rank of battalion chief, my office brought me right back over here to the gate outside of Leisure World. So I had the responsibility for Leisure World, not only for my parents, but for this community in my uh, not only for in my personal life, but in my professional life. I had the responsibility for not only the Leisure World community, but also some surrounding jurisdictions. And now, uh, since I saw you all last, last year, Chief Goldstein uh, found it appropriate to promote me. So it took me out of this office, but now has moved me over to Gaithersburg, which is where, when people call 911, which is where your uh, calls are filtered into. So again, making me, although indirectly, but responsible for the Leisure World community. Um, so it's important to me. It's important to me, and I think it's also important that you should know that everybody sitting on this stage has a personal connection. They're not just here because um, somebody told them to, or you know, they have a personal connection. Um, Jimmy Resnick, and Brian Geraci, they are retired Montgomery County chiefs, battalion chiefs, who are now moving on to bigger things. And Chief Geraci here is the state fire marshal for the entire state of Maryland, right? So he is having direct impact on this community. Jimmy Resnick didn't have to, but he found it appropriate to come back here and work very specifically on a senior you know, senior, uh, senior safety, in, in he's now recognized in the entire state of Maryland, but he works here for you in Montgomery County. Uh, on the far end here, this is not, this guy on the far end, he is not just a chief in the fire department, he is the chief of Montgomery County Fire Department. So he saw it personally enough to come here and be with you here, you know, be here with you today. So that's important stuff, and you should know who is uh, who? Who has your best interest at heart? Um, those guys that are back there in the back, who are always quiet, flying under the radar, they are the firefighters that work right outside your gate. Um, they're quiet. They're shy. Uh, don't necessarily like to be recognized. But for the years that I was assigned to uh, Company Twenty Five, and my office was there. This group of guys made me look good every single day. Uh, I'm not the one who's coming to your house, responding to your call. It's those guys back there in the back that are doing it. So, um, you know, it's personal to us. And so I just thought you guys should know that before I move on and talk about uh, the 911 system. So now that I've been promoted as the assistant chief to 911, I have learned a lot. Uh, there are things about the 911 system that I didn't even know. Um, but I think it's important to pass on to you today. Just like uh, Chief Goldstein pointed out, technology is changing all of the time. 
And as part of the 911 system, we need to change technology to keep up with how we track calls coming into 911 and how we dispatch units uh, all over Montgomery County. You should know that 911 is not there. And some of you all, I guess I should ask by a show of hands, how many people have had in here have had to call 911? Anybody in here? So that I say about half the crowd, perhaps, has had to call 911 in Montgomery County. And one of the things you should know is that you need to call us early. Don't hesitate, don't wait, don't think about it. If there's something in your voice that asks the question, should I call 911, that means you need to be heading to the phone. Have the phone in your hand uh, and be dialing. If that question ever comes up, you should also know where you are. It is so important. Know where you are in your community. Pay attention to your surroundings. Have that information available when you call 911. Keep in mind that when you dial 911, you're not calling the local firehouse. You're not calling my office. You're calling a central location. And keep in mind that those people who are answering the phone they're responsible for you, that's true, but keep in mind, they're responsible for all of Montgomery County. So just saying to them, uh, you know, I'm in, you know, I, I'm at, uh, I don't know, I'm in Mutual 16 or Mutual Clubhouse 18. Two. I'm sorry? Clubhouse 2. I'm in Clubhouse 2. <laughs> you know, there's a big emergency here, I'm in Clubhouse 2. Thanks, G. Keep in mind that Clubhouse 2 that person sitting up there, there may be, there may be six or seven listings called Clubhouse 2 in Montgomery County. So know where you are. You know, be able to give you know specific information. I am across the street from. I am near. You know, be distinguish. Yes, I live at 3100 North Leisure World Boulevard, but I am currently at Clubhouse 2, and there is an emergency going on here. Be able to describe to those people what the emergency is, what you see. Feel free to tell them if things are changing and how things are evolving from your perspective. Don't assume that somebody else is going to call. Call us early. It's okay with us if we get three, four, or five phone calls on the same thing because that allows us to hear about the emergency from a lot of different perspectives. So that's okay. The other thing you should know is that it's a, a long story, but I'll make it really, really short. We ask a lot of questions, and some people are very frustrated with all the questions that we ask. Why are you asking me so many questions, people say. Just send somebody. And please know that we are sending somebody. And keep in mind that the people who you're talking to on the telephone are not the same people that have to get on the ambulance or on the fire truck to help you. They are responsible for collecting data and information so that we can give it to uh, the folks that are responding to you. Please know that instantly we have some help on the way. Help is coming to you. But the more we're able to describe to the people who are coming, the better we're able to describe the situation, the incident, the better chance we have of giving the right resources to you, the right amount of help, in, uh, in, in an early amount of time. Sure, we can, all, these guys back here can always call back on their radio and ask for more help, or they can say, all the help that's coming, we don't necessarily need, but it helps us when you describe that emergency to us. And no, just work your way through the questions, and help is coming to you. Now some people say, where did you get all those questions from? Why are you asking me four times what my address is? It is required by the state of Maryland that we're just not willy-nilly asking you questions, but it has, uh, it has been decided um, on a state level that the series of questions that we ask are very helpful questions to ensure that, once again, we get the right help to you in the right time. So with that, um, is there anything else that I leave out anything? Pete, where are you? 
Oh, Chief. Okay, very good. So sometimes when you call, uh, what you say determines the type of help that you will get. So the fire department here in Montgomery County, there are a lot of different resources available to you. Now, again, you probably don't care which one shows up, you just want somebody to come help. But again, what you say can determine whether we send somebody for a broken fingernail or whether we send somebody for an amputated finger. It can make a difference. So we have a lot of different capabilities uh, uh, in Montgomery County. And don't be surprised if you say someone's having chest pains, somebody is having trouble breathing, and we send a fire truck. People ask me, why in the world did you send a fire truck? It's because we are fortunate enough here in Montgomery County to have the type of resources where we can get the fastest help to you and sometimes they may come on a fire truck. You're fortunate in Montgomery County that the people who often ride the fire engines and the fire trucks are not only firefighters, but they can also be paramedics that carry life-saving uh, life medications, life-saving monitors, equipment, a ton of things that can uh, help you in your, in your emergency situation. You're also fortunate uh, enough in Montgomery County that this guy over here has said that in even, has, has said that 90% of the time, even on a really bad day, we're gonna get help to you probably within about six or seven minutes. That's really good. Right? And so that's even for people who are living sometimes in the far stretches of Montgomery County, up in our Poosville area, you know, up in our Damascus area, some people who may be a little bit further away from the more populated areas. So um, I just want to talk to you a little bit about the 911 system. Anybody who has more detailed questions, I'll be around and be more than happy to, to talk about some more specific information. But Pete Perringer, he keeps me on task. So I'm looking to him to say, for all those of you all who don't know, he's our public information officer. You probably see him on TV all the time. But he keeps me on task, and he'll tell me, Pete, is there anything else I need to? Yeah, we're fast, we're well-trained, and we're nice. Yeah, we're fast, we're well-trained, and we're nice. The other thing is that person you're talking to is medically trained to give you instructions. Okay? The Worst scenario will be if we have to help you do CPR on a person you're, you're present with, a person who is not breathing and has no pulse. But we can work you through hands-only CPR. So that man or woman who's on the phone with you is medically trained and capable and has been through scenarios and practice and many, many, many thousands of calls and he or she can give you the coaching, the encouragement, the, the, the information, and the skills that you need to do to help your loved one, to help the friend, to help the bystander that you're now with address that medical emergency and give you what we identify as pre-arrival instructions. So they're asking you those questions because we want to get you the right resources to you, but then they're ready to transition that to giving you instructions and they take you as far as they can and as far as you're willing to go with those pre-arrival instructions and with that you can make a difference with your friends with your loved ones <coughs> using that cpr as an example one of the first questions they're going to say is there an automated defibrillator nearby you may not know but you're going to turn to the person maybe next to you and say is there an aed here and bam, one shows up. That's part of that level of questioning, that prompting that's going to help save that person. And that's one of the key factors of all those questions that they ask you. So, yes, Dee said it. It is frustrating. It's frustrating to us when we have to end up calling the, the 911 system. But we understand and very much cherish the purpose of why it's there. So, a ton of questions if you have them, you can you know, hit us up on, on the side. Okay, so I think we're taking questions at the end, is that right? Yeah. Okay, 
So we're taking questions at the end, but I just want you to know, again, I go back to my commitment to this community. You know, it's my goal to see this auditorium full, right? It's my goal to, um, to, to help, to teach you all, to help us help you. Uh, and, and, and you truly are the first link to our 911 system. Uh, you all uh, being watchful, bystanders, paying attention to your community, knowing, being aware of your surroundings, having, you know, coming to things like this, having additional information. Uh, you all, uh, smoke detectors are good, uh, but you all are much, much better. You all are much better and knowing uh, information, being well informed, being trained, sharing this type of information um, with your neighbors, friends, loved ones, even if they don't live here. You know, I know Jimmy's going to talk about it, but, you know, calling uh, or making sure you have working smoke detectors, making sure um, you, you, you're, you're aware of what smoke does, how smoke travels, the safety of the home or the apartment or the town home that you live in. Understanding that can kind of help squash a lot of this. So with that, I will turn it over to... Oh, okay. I think the next call your speaker will be Jim Resnick. Okay. Thank you, Dee. Real quick, a little crowd participation. Can we have a hand for Chief Goldstein? I'm going to keep this kind of short, but first thing, I'm going to deflect this. Uh, Lieutenant Henry. Uh, as, as Dee said before, these guys hate this. <laughs> but they should have known that this was coming. Uh, can you introduce yourself, and you can use the mic down here real quick, just introduce yourself and if you want to either have the fellows give a shout out as to who they are or whatever, but I want you guys to recognize the men and women who are serving your community for today. Today is V-Shift. There's another group that's coming tomorrow, there's another group that's coming the day after, and then these folks will come again on Friday, and that's our rotation. So if you could go ahead and just tell them who you guys have here today. All right, folks, I'm Lieutenant Henry. Uh, I'm the officer of the engine that came, engine 725. That's right outside your gates. Driving me today is Master Firefighter Paramedic Turner. In the back of the fire engine, we have uh, Firefighter 3 Payne. Also in the back of the fire engine, we have Firefighter 3 Paramedic Miller. And then we also have our ambulance crew here today. We have Firefighter 3 uh, Ryan Ty. And firefighter one, uh, Jocelyn. Uh, and real quick, by the way, before you go away, anything you want them to know about what you guys do? <laughs> like the chief said, all the chiefs have said, that we're an all hazard fire department. Uh, we're here. To serve not only the residents, but the commuters that come through Montgomery County. Um, so whatever you guys need, you're going to get somebody there fast, like the PIO said, friendly and effective. So, if you need us, thank you. I'm going to make my end of things real quick. Show of hands, who here has heard me speak before? Probably half, two thirds of the room. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard me speak before, come to another event, all right? No, but seriously, smoke alarms. That's my big thing. What, for those of you who have heard me speak about smoke alarms before, what has changed since the last time you heard me speak is, it's now October. And in a little more than two months, it's going to be January 1st of 2018, which is a very, very, very big and a very important date for the residents of not just Montgomery County, but the state of Maryland. The new Maryland smoke alarm law becomes fully effective January 1st of 2018. And what that means is that when you look up, when you look up in your home, at a friend's home, any residence, you should see a smoke alarm that is less than 10 years old. You should see a smoke alarm that has a power source 
that is either hardwired, meaning it's hooked in to the electrical system of the home, or a smoke alarm that has a sealed 10-year long-life battery, you where you know? don't have to get up on the ladder and change the battery every six months. We've been saying over, over, over again, you got to get up every six months, check your clocks, check, change, change your clocks, check your batteries, or change your clocks, check, uh, change your batteries. Now we want you to check that smoke alarm. Make sure it works. But the smoke alarm and the battery inside of it should last for 10 years. And after 10 years, the entire unit comes down and a whole new unit goes up. How do we check the functionality of our smoke alarms? Anyone? With a broomstick. With a broomstick, with a yardstick, I heard someone say, not by burning dinner. Okay? <laughs> that is not an acceptable way to test. Okay? We want to make sure that our smoke alarms are working, and we want to make sure that they're no more than two, that they're less than 10 years old. How can you tell the age of a smoke alarm? Well, on most smoke alarms, it's written on this side of the smoke alarm. This side of the smoke alarm, unfortunately, is the side that's up against the ceiling or high up against the wall, so it may be difficult to see. We have firefighters. Actually, fellas in the back corner over there, could you just raise your hands? Thank you very much. These are three of the firefighters that we have that are part of our team where we'll come to your home, we'll check your existing smoke alarms. We'll make sure that they're in compliance and that they're working. Now, many, many people here at Leisure World have uh, resources available through PPD. If the, per if the oh, PPD means, stands for? Physical Properties Department, okay? The Physical Properties Department of Leisure World you may have a contract with them through your mutual, or you individually may have a contract with PPD, and they will check your smoke alarms, and they can replace them. The fire department, Montgomery County Fire and Rescue Service, through the leadership of Chief Goldstein, we can not only check, but we can also provide and install new smoke alarms, but only for homes that have battery-only smoke alarms. If you live in any one of the uh, high-rises, if you live in any one of the mutuals that has what we call multi-family dwellings, homes that, it's not a home, it's an apartment building, it could be a garden apartment or something like that, then your smoke alarms must be hardwired. We are not electricians. We are not allowed to change out hardwired smoke alarms. You need to get a qualified electrician to do that job so it's done correctly, it's done safely, and you will have the tools that you need. This is part of early warning, which is part of the whole process of what we're trying to encourage today. Early warning, early suppression, early calling 911, and as Chief Goldstein said, early action. Know what to do when your smoke alarm goes off. Have a plan already. If this smoke alarm goes off, I'm going to that exit because that's the closest exit to where I am. Know where that exit is. And what about if that exit is blocked? What's my secondary plan? We should all have a plan A, a plan B, a plan C. I'd like to take a quick moment and again recognize Duke Ducharme for all of his leadership with the uh, Emergency Preparedness Committee, uh, to Don Pruitt for his work as the co-chair of the committee and for all the members of the Emergency Preparedness Committee. And also a special shout out to Richard Schultz, the director of security here at Leisure World for all that he does for you, he and his staff do for you guys every single day. They are integral players in your safety. They work very, very closely with fire and rescue and we could not be prouder to work for your community. Thank you. I think the next speaker will be Dr. Munger. As I said, my name is Jim Munger. I'm one of the associates with uh, Blue is Incorporated here in the United States, uh, which is a <clears throat> company that uh, markets a very specific, very specialized type of fire protection system. Uh, just to give you an idea of where I'm coming from, I started as a firefighter some 40 years ago and spent a number of years in the fire department before I went to the state fire marshal's office 
uh, in Alabama, which is where I'm originally from, and then I've been in private consulting practice for a number of years since that time. Uh, and as I said, as part of this uh, team here with uh, Plumas, and this, we've got a couple of our folks sitting in here. Aaron, who is our scheduler, kind of corraler, herding cats, trying to keep us where we're supposed to be when. Uh, Ms. Gula, who's our newest engineer on staff. And then the uh, tall, distinguished gentleman over here, uh, Yusuf, who is with Plumish UK, uh, who is actually one of the inventors of this particular system. And besides that, it's got a real cool accent. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, we were talking to a couple of people before we got started. And I know some of your buildings here are sprinklers. Uh, from a conversation that I had with one of the ladies, apparently that somebody that talked to you about some other types of sprinkler systems maybe in the past. This is an entirely different approach to that fire protection problem. Uh, and we have tailored this presentation uh, to look at just very, very specific solutions uh, that could exist here uh, at leisure world. And one of those is what we call the personal protective system, or the PPS. And this is a whole entire different approach to this. And this system is completely self-contained. It contains the water supply tank, it contains the pump, a battery backup to make the pump work. It also contains a diver, in other words, it can, when it activates, automatically notifies the fire department uh, that the system has been activated. Uh, as well as if something has gone wrong with the system. And while this can be used for a variety of purposes, one of the things that we saw when we first started working with this was its application to what we refer to as that high-risk audience. And as the chief alluded to a while ago, as we age, we become more vulnerable to fire. I'm in the same category that you folks are. We get older, we're in one of those that that just happens to. It's just the way the statistics are, it's a fact of life. And particularly with that, if we've got someone who's on oxygen, uh, which increases the risk even more, uh, you may have someone who is maybe in hospice care or otherwise in that. And of course, one of the things we recognize with our lads, a lot of times the caregiver of the person in the hospice care isn't much better off than the person in the hospice care. So you've kind of got some, some full circle things going on. But this is a system that is completely portable, that can be placed into that room where the, the person is at, uh, that's yeah. using oxygen or is uh, not capable very much of self-preservation. Uh, so it's got the tank is contained, and then it's got a cover that goes over top of it. This operates uh, with a flame detector. The flame detector uh, activates the unit, and you'll see a little bit, I'm not sure if my sound's working, but it actually gives a, uh, a voice warning that, you know, put out the fire or the system will activate when it does a countdown. These systems use very little water. That was one of the questions I think one of the ladies asked me this morning. This is designed to operate. It flows about a gallon and a half a minute. So there's very little water that's going to end up in place other than what needs to go on the fire itself. So that's it. Come on. There we go. So there we go. Like I said, this can be brought in. We've got several of these that fire departments have that they put into high-risk audiences. So we've got a self-contained water tank, the battery, the dialer, and of course we're using the flame detection primarily. So we've got a little demo here where we've got someone whose clothes have been ignited. So the heat detector has picked that up. It's giving that verbal warning, uh, extinguish the fire or the system will activate. And it may be difficult to see all that, but now the mist is coming out. This is a very, very fine mist. And one of the things that, you know, that gets a little more technical about that. But one of the things with using water as an extinguishing agent, without getting too real geeky about it, but basically, the more finely divided you break the water up, the more mist that you make it, the more effective it is at absorbing that heat from the fire. 
So that's the reason that we can operate by flowing only about a gallon and a half a minute, where a typical sprinkler head may be discharging 10, 12, 20, 30 gallons a minute. Makes a real big difference. So we've got the personal protective system. Like I said, it's completely portable. Uh, it's reusable. Uh, whether that would be someone that you know, individually you purchase one of them or obtain one of them. We've also talked about the fact that maybe the facility folks here would acquire some and be able to uh, put them where they needed to be for some of the high risk folks. So we've got the PPS system. Now we're going to demonstrate all of these systems here outside in the parking lot when all of the speakers are done. You might also remember a few moments ago that the chief mentioned that one of the highest causes of residential fires are cooking fires. And he said, some of your apartments and your townhouses out here are sprinklers, some of them are not. Uh, so this is really going to the ones that don't have any protection in them. So we've got some systems that are specific that could be put just in the kitchen. If you were trying to target where it's more likely that we're going to have a fire, then that's where we could put our resources, is in that kitchen environment. So like I said, those kitchen fires, the cooking fires account for almost 50% of the fires that happen in the United States every year. They cause 500 fatalities, give or take, every year. 6,000 people get hurt with kitchen fires, and it causes over a billion dollars worth of property damage. So it's something that we need to pay attention to, and what can we do to reduce those deaths, the injuries, and the property damage, and these particular systems can help you do that. One of the other unique systems that the auto mist system has from Plumas is when you've got a typical sprinkler, like we're in these, the ceilings right here, they put out, we often describe it as kind of an umbrella pattern of water. So it's kind of covering a general area. And if, depending on where the fire is located, depending on where the sprinkler heads are, you may get in more than, more than one sprinkler head operating. Because that's just the nature of the beast. So there's a significant amount of water. Don't get me wrong, I'm a strong believer in sprinkler systems. That's what I was small for. But what makes this system different is that rather than having heads in the ceiling, we what we call a smart scan head. It's actually mounted on the wall, about light switch level. Inside that head that's going to ultimately discharge the water mist is actually an infrared sensor. So there's a heat detector in the room. The heat detector activates, says, hey, I think we've got a fire. At which case, this head pops out, this is the closed version, it pops out and it scans the room. And what's it looking for? It's looking for that heat energy so that now I can locate the exact location of that fire and I can put the agent, the water, directly on that fire location. Not on a broad general area like typical sprinkler protection, but directing it directly where it needs to go. This is a test that we've done in our laboratory. Uh, <clears throat> we've got a fairly large pot of grease on the stove. Of course, this has been sped up to play back. The smart scan head is on the wall on that side, kind of underneath that shelf. It's kind of hard to see, but you can see it actually has a pot down. It's turned into that. And then what's it looking for? It's actually scanning the room, looking for that, that highest source of heat. Now the mist is discharged. Now a lot of people say, well, wait, but you're putting water on a grease fire. You've told us for years, don't do that. But because this is so finely divided, it's actually able to absorb that heat energy. And it doesn't create the problems like what would happen if you poured water into the pot. It's an entirely different, different event. So from the time this <clears throat> ignited off, that fire was controlled extinguished in about two and a half minutes. And if you think about it, 
if this system was discharging, it would take a gallon and a half a minute. Even if it operated for the entire two minutes, two and a half minutes, how much water did I put in the floor? Very little. We've done a lot of these tests and this is absolutely amazing that you could have that kind of fire on the back end of the room when it just virtually dry. Because all of that water is directed directly at the source of the fire. So it's absorbing all of that heat energy and I've not got a whole lot of extra water vapor floating around. Really very efficient. Now the original system that Plumas had uh, from the folks in the UK. And the UK is a lot like the United States when it comes to fire problems. One of their bigger fire problems in the residential environment was cooking fires. And particularly with fish and chips. And Yusef is one of these guys. He's not a fire protection guy. Okay? He's a mechanical engineer, very bright individual. And he's one of these guys who just loves solving problems. He went, hmm, that's a problem. How do we fix that? And particularly, how do we come up with a solution that can be put into existing occupancies without a whole lot of difficulty? So this is the first system that they came up with. There's a pump unit that mounts underneath the site. It's the same pump we use in all of our systems. The pump probably would be best correlated at about the size of the typical computer processing unit cabinet. So it's not very large. The original system actually used a head that was part of the faucet. In the UK, all of their faucets are basically a similar post where ours are double and got all kinds of different things. Uh, we don't use this particular faucet arrangement here in the US. We've got another separate head that can mount on the counter. Typically, we'll use the hole where the sprayer might go or the soap dispenser. Uh, or we can pull on the countertop. <clears throat> Again, the water supply. To go back to that, of all of that, and the questions that we were asked, yeah, there's a point. Um, where sprinkler systems may require a considerable amount of water at considerable pressure, all of our systems are designed to operate. All they need is a gallon and a half a minute at 14 PSI. Folks, if you got enough water to flush the commode, take a shower, get a drink of water, etc., you've got more than enough water to make the system work. That's what makes us one of the things that makes us so different. And it just operates on the standard 110 minute circuit. So we saw the smart scan system a moment ago, which can be used in the kitchen, where it scans that. In this particular system, there's a heat detector again, but rather than scanning the kitchen, it basically, what we call it's a room filling head, it just basically fills up that kitchen, that room, with that fine mist. Come on, there we go. So heat detector to ceiling, these are wireless, so you don't have to worry about running wires. Communicates to the pump unit underneath the counter, turns the pump on, puts that fine mist out into the room, <coughs> and what you see there blowing off these little rubber caps to keep the nozzles from getting all stopped up. But a very, very fine mist, and it just basically fills the room and will put the fire out. So I mean, it just all depends on the environment, whether you wanted to go with the very basic approach, um, say in the kitchen environment where we just basically flood the entire room, although it's still a limited amount of water. Or you could go with that extra step with the uh, smart scan where it directs it directly at that. Um, it's just a matter of choice, uh, like some of them might do. Actually, the smart scan system can be designed to protect the entire apartment, dwelling, etc. Uh, we were just trying to concentrate on giving the hazards here today uh, of the PPS or the kitchen fires. And I guess we'll be questions after we all get done. Was that the game plan? Uh, yes, sir. I'm, and, uh, if you're finished speaking, yeah. Doctor, uh, the next few minutes, I'd say the next 20 minutes will be devoted to question and answers from all the speakers. So this was really short because we knew we were going to go outside and do demos where we can actually see them work. Okay? Not 
Um, we have a few minutes. We want any Q and A first. Yes. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, yes. Um, you may have covered it, and perhaps I missed it. But can the system uh, be tapped into the water supply? As yes, sir. Okay. So if you're not if you're not home and you have, for God forbid, a kitchen fire. Right. It doesn't. It does. Unlike sprinkler systems. Excuse me. Would you mind using yeah. the uh, microphone? Oh, I'm sorry. Unlike the typical sprinkler system that requires either a separate supply or increasing the overall domestic supply, this this plumber system operates at that one and a half gallons a minute, and I said that's the normal plumbing in the house. We literally, it's basic, you'll see when we get out in the parking lot, it's got a three quarter inch garden hose connected to it. It's all it takes. So you can retrofit real easily. You don't have to have a separate water supply. Um, you don't have to pay extra tap fees for an extra fire line. It goes right straight off the domestic floor. I live in a high rise and we have sprinkler systems. If I got a plumus, what is to prevent the whole place from flooding with the plumus and the sprinkler system if there were a kitchen fire? It'd be like double protection. Well, actually with the plumus system, unlike sprinklers, the plumus system in its programming is set to only discharge water for a certain period of time. So we, that, depending upon the hazard, I don't know, when we have to typical discharge time. Yeah. 10 minutes, you know, 30 minutes at the most, you are know, only a gallon and a half a minute. More than that, I would guess we probably would, the plumber system would activate first, and the sprinkler may never activate. But unlike the sprinklers that are continue to operate until somebody shows up and turns the water off, the plumber system, the software, We'll turn it off by itself. Brian, I didn't, Brian, I didn't know if you wanted to say something else about the high rise. Oh, uh, I mean, with regard, I mean, you, like you said, you have a sprinkler system in the high rise building, so you wouldn't combine both systems in there. You're going to leave the sprinkler system in place. This, this would be an extra expense for you to put that in. You're protected with the sprinkler system that's there right now, so. There's no need for this. This is, like the doctor said, this is for an existing situation that doesn't have any fire suppression system in it at all, such as the older units that we have here in New World, or you know, a single family home that was built many years ago before we had the sprinkler requirement here in Maryland. Uh, these are the types of systems that we're looking at putting in. And obviously, uh, we have a demonstration with the doc and the company coming up in December. We have about a hundred uh, high-rise residential structures here in Maryland that don't have any sprinklers in them. So we're looking at doing a demonstration for those folks in, uh, in hopes that uh, they may go down this path and uh, install these systems in those buildings as well, so uh, to protect those folks. I know I'm talking to Jimmy before we started. I think you had one incident here fairly recently in one of the high-rises in the sunrooms that aren't sprinklered. Correct. That would be a great place to. Fatal yep, there was a fatal. You know, if you wanted to get protect, you know, that extra protection, if you could ask for that, it could be put into that summer and we'll take care of that. Um, what kind of money are we talking about? Let's talk about, like in that kitchen one, which is the source of most fire, fires in homes. So, how much are we talking about? What's a range that you would uh, expect, to, including the installation and the equipment? Obviously, every, you know, everyone's going to be a little different because of the configuration. Yeah, but just give us a ballpark. Are we talking about one, two, three, five thousand? So basically, for the faucet uh, system. Uh, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> you get to have a microphone now, Um So for the faucet system, you're looking at about eleven ninety nine. Um, if you're looking, if you like the puck, that's the one that just sits there. That one's 14. And then the smart scan system, um, the one that scans the room, is 1849. But that's going to include your pump, 20 feet of your hose, your head. Um, installation just kind of depends. Uh, anywhere between 150 and 300 dollars, I'd say, for each system. <clears throat> I have a question for Chief Resnick about um, fire 
Uh, smoke alarms. Smoke alarms. A uh, question that's come up in my mutual quite often. We have hardwired smoke alarms and we change the battery every year. And they always ask if it's hardwired, why do we have to worry about a battery? Great question, thank you. Hardwired smoke alarms have an almost guaranteed power source, but we've all experienced it before from a variety of different things, whether it's a severe storm that comes through or a squirrel that bites through an electrical cable. You lose your electrical power if the hardwired smoke alarms did not have a working, functional battery backup then you have no smoke alarm protection. So the battery backup is essential to a functioning smoke alarm to keep you safe. Um, a a hardwired smoke alarm with battery backup is generally considered to be superior to a battery only smoke alarm. Some people say, well, why don't, if I get a 10 year battery, why don't I just take down that hardwired smoke alarm and install just a battery only? Hardwired smoke alarms, the way I describe it, well, for this generation, I'll say they're like the Cadillac of smoke alarms. When I'm talking to a younger crowd, I say they're like the iPhone of smoke alarms. Um, they have the best technology, they have the most options for you, and one of the most important options is hardwired smoke alarms are generally interconnected. So if one of them goes off, they all go off. If I live in a condo, let's say I live in one of the greens, I probably have two or three hardwired smoke alarms. If a fire were to start in the other end of my apartment, all of the smoke alarms are gonna start going off as soon as any one of them smells smoke. So the ability for me to get that early warning, and that's what it comes down to, Early warning. We've heard about early suppression, putting the fire out quickly, keeping the fire in check quickly. We've talked about calling 911 quickly, but the early warning that that smoke alarm can give me it can be the difference between life and death. So that's where that it's a longer answer to a short question, but it's a really important question. Thank you for asking. Chief President, the vote for 2018 call for a final round of both um, battery and uh, electrical wired or one or the other? You understand the question? In, in 2018, what, what, is the, what is the new law? I'm passing uh, it off to the fire marshal. Thank you, sir. The thing that changes in 2018 is for battery only smoke alarms. You'll no longer be able to use a 9 volt battery smoke alarm to replace a battery powered smoke alarm. It has to be the 10 year sealed battery. Now, you may still see them out there in the, uh, in the Home Depots and those types of things. We've sent letters out to all the box stores saying, hey, the law is changing. Uh, the last three legislative sessions, we've tried to get the law changed to fix, to prevent the sale of nine volts here in the state of Maryland, and that's been shot down at the governor's office. So you may still see some nine volt battery powered smoke alarms out there, but you cannot use those. It can only be the 10, 10 year sealed battery with the hush feature. Also, one other thing that kind of goes to your question similarly is whether it's a hardwired smoke alarm or a battery only smoke alarm or a combination, the hardwired with the battery backup. If you read the owner's manual, and this is not just for today, if you read the owner's manual for a smoke alarm that you purchased 20 years ago, in the small print in that uh, smoke alarm's owner's manual, it said somewhere in there, this unit should be replaced every 10 years. And it doesn't have to do with the power source and those smoke alarms that use a small piece of radioactivity, it doesn't have to do with that. It has to do with the ability for that smoke alarm to reliably sense smoke and react to the smoke. And keep in mind, your smoke alarm that's up on the ceiling is subject to temperature changes, humidity changes, dust, pollen, you know, stink bugs, whatever, okay? Whatever you've got in your home, that's subject to it too. So it lessens the likelihood that it's going to uh, alert you reliably. And that's why every 10 years, here's an exercise, I'm not gonna have everyone do it right now, but in many audiences I say, pull out your cell phone and hold it up. 
Now, if your smoke alarm, is, I'm sorry, if your smoke alarm, if your cell phone is older than 10 years old, then keep it up in the air and otherwise put it in your pocket. And I look around the room and there's not a single cell phone up. And I say, why is your cell phone a new cell phone? Well, the old one wasn't reliable, the features weren't that good, it didn't do the things I needed to do. Same thing for your smoke alarm. Needs to be kept up to date. All right? Does that answer you? That was the question I wanted to ask you earlier. So it's thank you, sir. Appreciate You're welcome. Thank you, sir. Um, I'd just like to know how, how does the medical um, emergency monitors tie into the 911 system? D. Here I am. There she is. <laughs> Okay, let me go down front so I won't have so people won't have to turn all the way around to answer that question. Basically, uh, your devices are registered. You register your devices with a company, and that company, just like alarm companies, are tied into an alerting system. So your device, when you press a button or however your device is activated, it calls into a central location, like a like a almost like an ADT style, right? So it alerts a central location, and then that central location notifies uh, the 911 system with the registered information that you have provided. Is, does that answer your question? And would we encourage people to have those? Or? Is that time effective? That I'm sorry, I didn't hear that question. Is that time effective in terms of the process that they have to go through to eventually get to the... So it does add a step to the process. Uh, but the good news is they are able to provide us with a lot of really good information. Whatever you've provided to them, they are able to relate to, uh, relay to us so that when our providers get on the scene, they may already have a list of your medications. They may already know what your allergies are. So it does add a step, but it also saves time when we arrive on the scene. So it is a, a kind of a, a give or take. There was another question. I so, Yes, ma'am. Okay, you mentioned that 911 always give your location. Yes. Okay. So you're calling 911 and now you're having a heart attack. Now you're unconscious. You've already placed the call 911. Yes. Is there a way of them now tracking and figuring out where you are? There is a way. That's a great question. So what she's asking is if you are in the middle of an emergency, if you yourself are having an emergency and you have dialed 911, how do we know to find you? Why well, go back to all the technology that you heard about today? So if you have an old fashioned landline phone, that's the kind that plugs into the wall, all of your information is transferred over to us by this funny name called Annie Alley and it's transferred over to us as soon as the phone connects. So we already know where you are. Now we may not know the exact nature of your emergency, but help is coming. We're gonna send somebody that can help us figure out uh, what's going on. Now if, you have, if you've been able to tell us something, then we will base on the something that you have told us and we will send help. If you're not able to tell us anything, we're still gonna send help. It may be the police, it may be, but somebody's coming. Somebody's coming. Now, if you have a cell phone, um, cell phones these days, as Chief Resnick always said, are forever changing, and the technology in them is forever changing. So we now have this thing called two-phase technology. In your cell phone, you know how uh, you look on Google or you look on the map on your phone? That phone knows exactly where you are, right? That phone knows, this phone knows that every Wednesday at 10 o'clock you go to the grocery store. That's okay. Those phones, even the flip phones, still have a lot of new technology in them. It can zero down right to pretty much within a couple of feet of where you are. So if we have to, we will do what we call ping your phone. And pinging your phone is just using cross-references, you know, longitudinal information, latitude information to ping that phone. We know that that call is coming from somewhere, and we use that, I can say, on a fairly regular basis. We have people, let's say, that are out on the Potomac River, or if somebody who's out riding their bike, they're on a path in the woods, they don't know exactly where they are, but they've fallen and they've hurt their leg or they've twisted their ankle. We're able to cross-reference and ping and kind of narrow down where you are. And then that's the importance of new technology. We're moving to a place in technology 
Um, and so my mother always sighs when she, she's like, oh, you guys have gone too far. But, you know, we're trying to get to a place now where, you know, the Facebook Live and the texting and the tweeting, we're trying to get to a place where we can use all that technology for people to call 911. We're moving towards that now. We're moving to a place where we can, uh, if, if you happen to be, let's say, on, you know, on, over in Fairfax, um, or you're over in Prince George's County, that we can use, we can tap into their system to figure out what's going on over there. We can share resources. Sir, there's a lot of great technology that's coming down the road, all forever changing. We would love to take more, we'll take one last question and then we've got to get outside and you guys need to see what we've got going on outside. It's only going to take about 20, 25 minutes, but it's going to be worthwhile. But I've got one last question before we go outside. Yes, ma'am. So, uh, cooking fires and upgrading the kitchen range, is there a safer type of cooking service that the city should go to or avoid than others? Gas, the coil, other coils, ceramic, glass top. Yeah, the question was uh, regarding the range tops, and is there something that can be done? There, uh, as, as Chief Harris spoke about, there's, uh, the technology with stoves now are changing as well. And there's smart technology out there that will sense, uh, for electric stoves right now, it's out there, you can change the burners on those stoves, and it'll sense when there's an overheating condition and it'll shut itself down. Um, they're also going to gas stoves as well, so uh, that technology's out there. Uh, smart technology for the stoves out there, especially for, like I said, for the electric side. And I know the gas side's coming on board, but uh, you know, all you have to do is really change the burners out in the stoves, I believe, and uh, it has that smart technology in the, in the burner itself. And it will sense when it gets to a certain temperature, it'll shut the stove down. So, who, so. who could they talk to find out? Who could they talk to find out about it? Uh, you can talk to uh, you know you can talk to folks at Home Depot. You can talk to those people at Lowe's and those folks like that who sell stoves and those at range tops, and they can give you that information. Or you can go online and just search, yeah. do a search on that as well. There's also the stove top fire extinguishers. Yes, yeah. uh -huh. stove top and fire extinguishers. They mount in the hoods, and uh, and they discharge an agent that uh, can do that. Or you can install the dock system and. Uh, and have that as well. So there's a lot of things out there. I mean, there's even uh, there's even hoods that all that have suppression systems in them for the cooking service as well. Um, probably they're a little bit more than a plume system. I can tell you that. <laughs> but I've been researching it with my folks on the uh, for the existing apartment building. So, but there's a, there's a lot of technology out there for this, that's helping us prevent fires. Okay, folks, uh, it's time for the question and answer session. So we're now going outside. If you'll exit to your right, where the gentleman is, go ahead to, to your right. right. There's a lot of stairs over there, yeah. kind of steep. If you're concerned about that, go out the back and a left. The one on your right is the room that we're going to set on fire first. It does have no, has no sprinklers in it at all. We're going to let that room go to uh, what we call flashover, which is total room involvement. And the firefighter can put that room out, and then we'll uh, light the sprinkler side on the side, and you'll see how quickly the uh, sprinkler system will put the fire out. So as we talked about inside, we have smoke alarms inside these rooms. So that's our early detection, is having that smoke alarm. Fires are fast now, ladies and gentlemen. They get a lot faster with the modern furnace that you have in your home now. We have less than four minutes to get out of your house. Once that smoke alarm sounds, you've got to have that plan in place like Jimmy talked about, and getting out of your residence. So have two ways out, and no have a plan in place so you can escape the fire in a timely fashion so you don't get injured or killed. Okay, what we're gonna simulate is the fire in the back of the room here. We're gonna simulate maybe smoke material in a trash can in the corner behind the chair. You sorry to see the smoke. We have smoke alarm activation already, okay? So this is when the time starts, the clock starts ticking. Now's the time you got to get up and get out. Most of the fires that we see occur at night between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. when you're most vulnerable because you're asleep. So it's very important to have that plan in place and practice that plan with your family. Okay? So now you got to be starting to get up. You hear the smoke alarm going off. You need to start finding a way out of your home. Okay? So we have the early detection. We're going to start to see the fire grow in the back of the room. It's going to ignite the chair on fire. So again, now's the time to start getting up and getting out. 
don't have time to get dressed, you don't have time to grab your pets, you don't have time to grab your cell phones. We want you to get up and out of your home, go next door and call 911 immediately. So we get that early response. We have early detection, early response. Fire is going to grow. As we said, fires are a lot faster these days. It's not like the houses that you lived in before with your parents, but the regular types of furniture. Okay? This is the modern furniture. It's a lot more flammable, a lot more plastics. Okay, so it's going to burn a lot hotter. It's going to burn a lot faster. That's why we want to make sure that you have a plan in place to get out of your home. You're going to start to see the fire roll up over the ceiling. You're going to see the smoke start banking down. You see the fire. Watch the newspaper on the floor. You see the newspaper on the floor. You'll see that uh, start to get off gas here in a little bit. And, uh, and then off to the room will go into flash over. Now this chair is going to continue to burn. The heat's going to start heating up the other materials in the room, and those materials will ignite as well. Those will all just heat down. So you already see that, you can't really see at the top, but you'll see it later on when uh, we put everything out. The uh, smoke alarm was already melted off the ceiling, so you don't even hear it anymore, okay? So that early detection is already gone. So again, once you hear that smoke alarm go off, it's very important that you need to get up and start moving toward those exits to get it out of your home and get there to a place where you call 911 and get the fire department coming in a quick manner to handle this emergency. So typically what we see every year is, you know, folks that are dying of fire are dying from what? Smoke. Okay? From smoke inhalation. A lot of different products of combustion in there, different chemicals, carbon monoxide, uh, hydrogen cyanide, all those different things are going to affect your exit if you're going to become exposed to those. The one other thing we want you to do at night is make sure you close your bedroom doors. Okay? Close before you doze. That's what we're saying. The bedroom door is going to stop a lot of smoke, it's going to stop a lot of heat, it's going to stop the fire allow you to escape because if you can't get out then you need to start looking for that window exit and go out that window then make sure you can open your windows if you go home today make sure you can open the windows in your bedroom And again, the building that was not equipped with a sprinkler system. 
promenade. That's right. So uh, that's, that's, that's the buildings I'm focusing on. Yep.
furnace, and we're getting a little bit more heat, and we're getting a little bit more fire, the gas is going to go up. But again, once that temperature reaches 155 degrees, that sprinkler head is going to go off and uh, get the fire. There we go, we have sprinkler activation right there. You see the fire starts to die down. We're going to let that sprinkler head continue to flow. Time to get out of your home. So we're gonna let uh, the residential Miss guys go next. Yep. And I'll just ask you one last question: Which home would you rather live in? <laughs> Can we have a hand for Brian Geraci from the State Fire Marshal, and also the crews from Station 25 and Station 40? They are your local fire stations. Hello folks, Hi. Uh, my name's Yusef, um, uh, as Doc introduced me um, earlier, I'm from the UK. Hold it right up, oh, there that, you go. Is that better? Is that better? Okay, perfect. Yeah, so um, my company was formed about 10 years ago. Uh, we've been retrofitting our sprinkler alternative in and around the UK. We've protected over 5,000 homes, we've saved two lives. Uh, but now we are uh, huge fans of sprinkler systems um, at Bonus. Um, our, what we're trying to do is provide an option for retrofit. So these are in buildings which are not sprinklered, but still where the inhabitants want to have some form of active fire suppression. So I'm just going to take you through our, um, four of our systems. The very first one is, so we have a volume filling head. Um, this unit is mounted at light switch height. It has a series of water mist nozzles and when the system is activated by a heat detector which is mounted on your ceiling, it will fill the volume with mist to extinguish the fire. Um, so what I'm going to show you here is just a demonstration of the spray pan and you can see how little water it uses, how much water. system. Um, it's very similar to the volume filling uh, head in terms of the amount of water it uses, but it has an IR sensor mounted in this plate. What it will do is once it's activated, it will scan the room, it looks for that hot spot before deploying the mist into the location of the fire. So again, it really minimizes the amount of damage that is caused. So Eric is going to uh, simulate a heat source within the room with his blowtorch. So you can see at the moment now how it's scanning, looking for the location of that hot spot, that hot spot within the room. So it will sweep the room a couple of times. It just wants to make sure that it's pinpointing the fire in the in the right location. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh,